Good afternoon and welcome to the second external partner webinar for the Spring Hydrologic Outlook. This is Katie Hertel at the National Water Center. Today's briefing will be a general overview of the Spring Hydrologic Outlook for the Greater Mississippi, Suris River, Red River of the North, and Great Lakes Basin. Additional information and forecasts can be found online at www.weather.gov. Today's presenters are myself, Katie Hertel, a hydrologist at the National Water Center, and the Service Coordination Hydrologist from the Five River Forecast Center, Jim Knoll from Ohio Basin RFC, Corey Loveland from North Central RFC, Scott Dumer, the Development and Operations Hydrologist, filling in for Kevin Lau from Missouri Basin RFC, James Paul from the Arkansas Red Basin RFC, and Jeff Graschel from the Lower Mississippi RFC. This webinar is being recorded and a follow-up email will be sent with information on how to access this recording. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and type it into the question box on the GoToWebinar GUI and we will address it at the conclusion of the presentation. Let's jump right into it. Since our last webinar, two weeks ago, conditions have slightly changed. However, we are still expecting an elevated flood potential across the greater Mississippi River Basin this spring. Let's start off by taking a look at the precipitation across the basin for the season and how it compares to previous years. Starting current, looking at the graphic on the left, we did see a relatively dry period over the last two weeks since the first webinar, which was forecast on the CPC two-week outlook. Overall, though, we are still sitting much above normal for the season across the entire greater Mississippi basin. The graphic in the middle is showing the above average rainfall. Everything that you see in the green and blue shades on this map are above to much above normal, between 100 and 200% um, of, the, of the mean. The one exception to that is the, the portion of the upper Missouri basin highlighted there in red, uh, where we are below normal precipitation for this winter season. The image on the right is the same time period last year. One slight difference that I do want to draw your attention to is that this winter, the percent of mean is not quite as large and widespread as it was this time last year. So even though this winter's precip is above normal, it is not quite at the same magnitude as last year's across the majority of the basin. If we move on to the next slide, looking at this winter's temperatures and their departure from the mean, you will see a big difference from last year. Most of the greater Mississippi River Basin is experiencing above normal temperatures, ranging from one to six degrees above normal. We're also seeing a more intense warm core present this year across the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes, Tennessee Cumberland Valley, and into the mid-Mississippi Valley area. Uh, the exception to this is some pockets in the northern plains that are now close to normal after experiencing some colder weather the last two weeks, which you can see in the graphic on the left. In comparison to last year, uh, as you can see in the graphic on the right, it was very cold across the upper Midwest and into the northern plains and upper Mississippi Valley. So this overall warm-up is impacting the amount of ice that has formed in these basins relative to last year. The ice conditions are near normal in most areas and below normal in the Ohio Valley. Uh, each RFC will touch on this a little later in the presentation. However, I do want to stress that even though the temperatures across uh, the northern greater Mississippi River Basin are above normal, it is still very cold up there, so the ground is frozen, increasing the runoff potential um, this spring. Uh, we'll see just how widespread this is in the soil moisture content in a few slides. Moving on to the next slide showing snowfall so far this winter, we see that it is really just contained to an area from the Great Lakes to the upper Midwest where 100 to 200% above normal snowfall has fallen. Elsewhere, the snowfall is really at or just slightly below normal. So a slight change from the last webinar and, and an even bigger change from last year, which you can see in the image on the right, where the snowfall percent mean was much greater and more widespread, particularly across the northern portions of the basin. Uh, looking now at the snow water content across the greater Mississippi Basin, the first thing you'll notice here is that we have similar to maybe just a little less snow water content uh, across the Great Lakes and into northern Minnesota as compared to last year. Uh, we do have similar snow water content to last year in the eastern Dakotas, but to the west and south of there, it's not quite as widespread, especially across Iowa and south of I-80, where we're seeing um, just less snow content than we were last year. We move on to look at soil moisture. Um, our soil moistures are very, very above normal in the upper fifth percentile across the entire basin and over the Great Lakes. 
Uh, so our antecedent conditions are very, very wet this year across the majority of the basin, especially in those northern states and the headwaters of the Mississippi as well. Now looking at the updated U.S. Drought Monitor, which was just updated today, um, we are, it's no surprise after seeing the last slide that uh, we do not have any drought across the Mississippi Basin, really just some pockets in the headwaters of the Arkansas Red River Basin. Uh, otherwise, not much to talk about drought-wise here. Now taking a look at the USGS seven-day stream flows across the basin, most of the area is, extreming normal, is experiencing normal to above normal stream flow that you can see in the green and blues here. Uh, this is a bit of a change from two weeks ago, as you can see in the graphic at the bottom right, which makes sense given uh, our period of dry weather, which has allowed some of these basins time to recover and return to normal. But you will notice the white sections in the upper Midwest and the Northern Plains, that's where we're iced in or where seasonal gauges are not currently taking measurements. But where you do see some of those blues and blacks, that's indicating that where there is flow, it is much above normal. Uh, next, taking a look at the amount of flood storage that the United States Army Corps of Engineers has released within the Mississippi Basin. Uh, we still have plenty of room storage-wise right now. Of note, the Army Corps, in conjunction with the Tennessee Valley Authority, has been able to move water throughout the Tennessee Cumberland system since it's been dry this past week, which has allowed um, them to bring the levels down at the Kentucky and Barkley pools there. Another change that can be seen is at the Yazoo River, uh, the storage is just above 50% uh, due to the heavy rain that the South has experienced over the last two weeks, um, but this is still more storage availability than we were seeing at this time last year. Moving on to the next slide, this has been an ongoing issue in the Great Lakes, so we did want to highlight this. Uh, this information comes from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District. Uh, Lake Superior is forecast within several inches of monthly record highs through June. Lake Michigan and Huron is forecast to be above its levels from last year across the entire forecast period and is forecast to break record highs in each month through June. And Lake St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario are all forecast to be below record highs through June. This is important because flooding of inland streams and rivers will be slower than normal to drain into these lakes and any future storm systems that come through this spring may cause erosion and lakeshore flooding which has already occurred at many of these locations. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the precipitation forecast and the weather and climate outlooks that will influence our hydrologic river outlooks into the spring. Precipitation over the next seven days will really be focused across the eastern portions of the Arkansas Red Basin through the mid-Mississippi Valley and into the Ohio River Valley. Two to five inches of precipitation is forecast through March 5th, uh, but the majority of this rainfall will come with a low pressure system on day six. Now, if we move on to the week two uh, outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, above normal temperatures are expected to return to the western portions of the Mississippi Basin through March 11th. And we are expecting to see normal precipitation in week two across the eastern portion of the basin and just slightly below normal precipitation as we move back out to the west. However, as noted on the last slide, the basin will get a relatively heavy rainfall just before week two and models are starting to pick up on another major weather system bringing rain to the Mississippi basin in week three. So overall, we are still expecting um, to enter into a more active rain pattern. We can see this on the next slide if we look further out at the monthly and seasonal outlooks. As expected, a warm-up will be seen across the lower Mississippi Valley and into the Ohio Valley. Um, equal chances are seen across the plains and below normal temperatures are predicted, predicted for the western Dakotas and into Montana. We do expect, as is common, that the above normal precipitation storm track from the lower Mississippi will gradually shift to the north and bring above normal precipitation to the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes region, mid to upper Mississippi Valley, and the Missouri River Valley. It's important to remember that much of the susceptibility to flooding in the greater Mississippi Basin is driven by convective rainstorms, which are typical in the spring. And finally, we're going to transition from our weather and climate outlooks into how this is all expected to impact the hydrologic outlooks for the spring. So on this slide, as you can see, we are expecting above average potential of widespread minor to moderate flooding across the greater Mississippi River Basin. We are also expecting major flooding along the upper to mid Mississippi River, 
portions of the Missouri River Basin and in the Red River of the North Basin due to snow water content and expected above normal precipitation this spring. And now I'm going to pass it over to Jim Knoll from Ohio River Basin, who will discuss the potential for flooding in his basin. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jim, as, as Katie said, here at the Ohio River Forecast Center. We're going to talk about the flood risk here in the Ohio Valley and Cumberland Basins as we move over the next few months. Really not much has changed, as Katie said. Um, we're expecting a widespread minor flooding uh, across the Ohio Basin, especially in the western half and southern half of the basin. Even though you don't see quite as many colors this week as two weeks ago, I want to stress that, for example, the upper Ohio River itself from Pittsburgh down to Cincinnati, the normal probability of reaching flood stage is only 10 to 30 percent. Our Basically what happens here in the Ohio Basin is we're driven so much by rainfall and thunderstorms that if we get 50% or higher probabilities, that's very significant probabilities actually. So we are expecting a pretty widespread uh, minor flood event at least in the Ohio Basin. But if you go on to the next slide, you will see looking more at the 25 and greater percent chance, which is a little bit better um, assessment for the Ohio Valley of what to expect, you'll see a much more uh, colorful map. And that's because we are basically talking about uh, much more in the moderate floods and even some major floods in those purples in southeast Illinois, Indiana, down into Kentucky. And that's a 25 to 50 percent probability. And that's much more common, um, again, because our probabilities are lower here. And so the risk is still elevated than relative to normal. So I just wanted to stress that, that even though we see a little bit less color this week, we expect actually that color to go back up with the uh, upcoming weather pattern that is expected in the month of March. Again, rainfall and thunderstorms are the really driving factors in the Ohio Basin, unlike uh, other basins, and snow is really not the driver here. And that's why you always usually see a little bit lower probabilities in the Ohio Basin. If we break it down, moving on to the next slide, we're going to go ahead and look at um, <clears throat> Illinois and uh, Eastern Illinois and Indiana first. And we do expect, uh, just like two weeks ago, widespread minor flooding for the Maumee, Wabash, White, and Little Wabash basins. Um, but it should be noted that basically we are expecting uh, a 25 to 50 percent chance of moderate or greater flooding in these basins also in the, the state of Indiana and uh, southeast east central Illinois, except for the Maumee Basin, where pretty much just minor flooding is expected. So there is a real risk. So even though the colors are a little down at the 50 percent this week, um, there is a real risk still of moderate to major flooding in portions of Indiana and east central southeast Illinois. Moving on to the next slide, we'll shift south into the state of Kentucky and Tennessee, and we still do expect at least a 50% chance of um, minor flooding uh, for the Kentucky and Green River basins in the state of Kentucky, but again, there is at least a 25 to 50% chance of moderate or greater flooding in the Kentucky Green and Upper Cumberland basins. So. Again, a lot of these probabilities are just below 50%, so you're not seeing quite as many on the map this week as two weeks ago, um, but they're still there. They're just a few percentage points lower. Moving along to uh, Ohio and West Virginia, again, not much has changed here either. We're still expecting at least a 50% chance of uh, flooding uh, in the Maumee and the Muskingum Basins in Ohio. We also expect Lake Erie shoreline flooding um, this spring due to the high water levels that Katie was talking about. Uh, it's going to be heavily driven by wind storms. So depending on how many wind storms and how intense those wind storms are out of the northeast and northwest wind, that is the kind of wind direction that will pile water up uh, along the shoreline. In addition to if we have river flooding coming into Lake Erie at the same time, um, that will enhance that shoreline flooding. Uh, it should be noted that there is at least a 25 to 50 percent chance of minor flooding in the Maumee, Muskingum, Scioto, Great Miami, and Monongahela basins. Moving on to the next slide, looking at the Ohio River, the flood from a few weeks ago that translated down the Ohio um, has worked all the way down to the bottom of the Ohio, Ohio River now. Um, new flooding is expected. Um, greater than a 50 percent chance of that flooding will be from Newburgh Lock and Dam downstream from southern Indiana down into western Kentucky, southern Illinois, and there's at least a 25% chance of reaching moderate flood levels from Shawneetown, Illinois, and downstream. 
But again, it is really important to note again that um, the risk for flooding does appear to be going back up now over the next several weeks. Moving on to the next slide, um, this is going to kind of highlight that. Um, we, do also, we do have a seven to 10 day um, flood risk that is on the increase in the Southern Ohio Valley down into the Cumberland Basin as that storm system that KDE was showing will be coming out next week. Um, and so we really focus on one of our planning tools, looking at probabilities in the five to 10 day range. And you'll see that highlighted area in uh, Southern Indiana, Kentucky down into Tennessee with a lot of orange and even reds, indicating that we do expect the threat of at least in those circles, a 30% or higher probability um, of um, minor to moderate flooding. And there is a risk of even potentially some major flooding, depending on how that storm system unfolds next week. Most indications now are that the Ohio River could go back up to similar levels that we saw earlier in the month of February as we move into the early and especially middle portions of March. Um, of course, whenever we get inside the five day window, um, like next week, then we wanna definitely make sure everybody uses our National Weather Service official forecast at water.weather.gov. And so moving on to the next slide, to summarize up for the um, Ohio Valley and Cumberland Basin, we do expect widespread minor flooding this spring throughout the uh, Ohio Valley, especially western and southern areas. Moderate to major flooding is still possible in about the lower half of the Ohio Valley down into the Cumberland Basin. Therefore, flood risk is considered relative to normal to be above normal for parts of Indiana, Eastern Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee. The upper Ohio basin is considered near normal flood risk, including the states of Ohio, West Virginia, Western Virginia, Western Pennsylvania, and Southwest New York. And again, depending on how the storm systems unfold this spring with wind and also potential river flooding, that could affect shoreline flooding along Lake Erie and beach erosion along with high water impacts are expected with those record to near record lake levels. And finally, rainfall and thunderstorms will be the final determinant of how much flooding we do get. But again, over the next three weeks, it does look like we have a significant increase in our flood risk in the Ohio and Cumberland Basin, and we ask you to monitor later forecasts. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Corey at the North Central River Forecast Center. Great, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone here at the North Central River Forecast Center. We've had a little bit of a change from our initial outlook issuance, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what has changed and what has not. So first, let's talk a little bit about our snow situation. Uh, as, recent, uh, as a result of recent uh, warmer temperatures, the snow line has mostly stayed the same since our initial outlook. Most of the very shallow snow cover that was in the southern tier of the area is now gone. We've had a roller coaster of temperatures this calendar year, and a snowstorm deposited a widespread one to two inches on February 17th. And then there's a large Arctic blast of frigid temperatures over the 19th and 21st of this month. This weather essentially has kept the snow, the soil, and all the ice conditions generally the same as our first outlook. And as you can see from the modeled snow water content graphic here, we have a widespread one to four inches of snow water equivalent across the river forecast area. Of course, higher water content exists up north around Lake Superior, as well as the northern parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, which are about four to six inches of snow water content right now. With the warmer temperatures, little to no snowpack is left in western North Dakota, Iowa, and Illinois. And on the next slide, We'll talk uh, a little bit about our snow water content ranking here. Uh, this is essentially showing our snow water content as depicted in our models here at the RFC. It's important to understand that the differences in rankings are a comparison of the modeled current conditions to the modeled averages. The amounts may reflect biases in the model, but generally the deviations from the 50% or the normal are reflective of the real world conditions. These rankings depict the snow deposition patterns over the winter months. As you can see, uh, across most of the northern tier of the, our RFC area, we're within the 80 to 100% uh, ranking uh, range there, mostly in 
the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Upper Peninsula, and Eastern North Dakota. Uh, some of the eastern and southeastern regions of the area are mostly near normal for the ranking of the snow water equivalent. And then as you go uh, towards uh, Iowa, southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, uh, those areas are near or just above normal there. And then of note is up uh, north, uh, northwest in the Suris River Basin, it's uh, generally below normal with the snow water equivalent there. And uh, next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about the frost depths. Uh, uh, right now, generally, frost depths are near to uh, below normal in our area. Uh, for at least this time of year right now, and uh, mostly within the three inch to foot and a half range, uh, some areas showing about two feet of frost depth. Uh, the current snow depth also is modeled and by no risk and shown in the background here for a reference compared to the frost depths and where the aerial coverage of the snow is. And again, frost depths uh, and frozen ground is not expected to be a key player in the spring melt and the runoff this spring. Uh, variations seen in the map here are just due to the variety of the localized conditions. On the next slide, with the ice jam threat, currently we have a low to a medium, low to a medium threat. And this is mostly due to the frigid temperatures that we saw early on in the winter, uh, driving the rapid ice production. Uh, we've seen some ice flooding early on in the winter. Uh, that's been observed in Illinois, Wisconsin, and uh, in, in Minnesota, along uh, the Mississippi River. And currently, right now, we're seeing some nuisance ice jam flooding in Wisconsin, but no damages have been reported there. So with recent warm temperatures uh, continuing, uh, we're not really seeing a, a threat to uh, break up ice jams in the spring. Uh, especially with uh, the forecasted warmer temperatures. Of note, from Lock and Dam 3 down to 27, right now little to no ice is reported, uh, except for Lock, uh, between Lock and Dam 4 and 13, there's about a 50 to 100% of ice cover with thicknesses ranging from 4 to 10 inches. And on Lake Pippin, ice measurements were taken, and those thicknesses ranged from about 2 to 17 inches. And of note on the Illinois, it's pretty much open water there. On the next slide, I uh, want to talk a little bit about our, our general flood outlook. Uh, as discussed previously, soil moistures remain high throughout the area and will be a primary driver with also the amount of high water snow, uh, high water of what, high amount of water content in the snowpack. Current conditions right now that we're modeling uh, we're showing about 103 forecast points that have a 50% or greater chance of going into moderate and major flooding in the next 90-day window. Uh, the, we, uh, we have currently 42 major uh, uh, flood stages predicted, which has gone down from our initial outlook when it was originally 53. Uh, but opposite of that, we have 60 uh, currently uh, moderate flood stage predictions, and that was um, 48, so that's gone up there. Uh, these images right now may be different than what you might see on the public AHAPS website uh, because it may not have been update, updated yet, but it should be updated uh, later today or early tomorrow. Um, of note is uh, uh, if you divvy all these up, these forecast points, uh, of course, the Mississippi River drainage contains most of these uh, predicted moderate and major flood uh, conditions where there's around 70 points there. Hudson Bay has 26 points and Great Lakes uh, drainage area is forecasted to have four points in the moderate to major flooding category. And as, as we can see uh, through here, as the continuation of the gradual warming trend continues, uh, we'll get some of that uh, snow to melt slowly and that will hopefully help the um, the flood situation. But the bottom line here is, is we have a widespread uh, significant flood outlook. On the next slide, I'll break it down into individual states and the chances of flooding here. So in the North Dakota and Northwestern Minnesota area, uh, the highlight here is the Red River of the North. That's our primary concern. Um, as you can see depicted on the graphic with the 
a widespread uh, chance of major flooding throughout the Red River of the North. And then up in the Suris Basin, that ranges between minor and moderate rain um, chances there. Um, mostly the flooding potential continues to be driven by the soil moisture and the snow water equivalent in both areas. And the differences in the magnitude mostly reflects, reflects the differences in the snow water content. So moving to Minnesota on the next slide, uh, right now, again, the, the story is the Mississippi itself uh, with uh, greater than a 50% chance of major flooding, uh, mostly below the St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, north of Minneapolis, uh, there's mostly a moderate uh, chance there. Uh, and then um, on the Minnesota, which is a Minnesota River, which is a tributary to the Mississippi, that's mostly a minor uh, in a minor category there for the next 90 day window. And again, this variation, uh, this wide variation is mostly attributed to the variance in the snow uh, water content and the soil moisture there. Looking at Wisconsin on the next slide, uh, the primary concern again in the Mississippi River Basin and also along the Minnesota and Wisconsin border there. And mostly widespread minor flooding is expected within the uh, within the state, uh, and then also elevated risks along the um, uh, on, in the Mich uh, lake uh, shore of Lake Michigan there, just due to the backwater effects and historic lake levels there. The concerns uh, here are the East, the Fox, the Oconto rivers, and also uh, near Green Bay, the the Manawak River as well. Uh, and again, might see some uh, backwater effects from high lake levels and also wind effects as well. Some of the isolated points that uh, that are of note are the on the Wisconsin, uh, the Trempolo, Kickapoo, the Tyler Forks, and the Wolf Rivers, and mostly minor flooding predicted along the Menominee River along the Wisconsin and Michigan border. On the next slide, looking at uh, isolating Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri, uh, again, primary concern is the, the main stem Mississippi, we have, uh, there's a 50% or chance, chance or, or greater of having major flooding above Lock and Dam 19, and then downstream from Lock and Dam 19 to St. Louis, uh, it reduces to a moderate chance of flooding there. But again, as you can see, there's a widespread minor and, mo minor and moderate flooding risk throughout the area. And again, want to talk a little bit about uh, some the historic lake levels affecting uh, the Chicago area and uh, and 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 uh, possibly possibly uh, creating some flooding situations there on the next slide looking at Michigan and northern Indiana uh, mostly minor flooding along the Muskegon the Grand St. Joseph Kankakee and Rifle Rivers and um, a lot of uh, the Huron River at Hamburg and Menominee River near McAllister having a moderate uh, flooding forecast there. And then lower flooding potential, mostly driven uh, by, again, by the snow water content and the soil moisture, but it still remains very high in the area. And lake levels, again, are very high on Lake Huron and Michigan, so might see some backwater effects um, as well. So to summarize everything here, we have um, as a whole significantly elevated uh, uh, flooding risk uh, ranging from the moderate to the major uh, flood potential, uh, mostly in the upper Mississippi and the Red River of the North. Those are the two basins that are of primary concern. Again, not much of an ice jam flooding concern this spring from the temperatures. Uh, most of this flood risk is again, driven by the wet soil conditions and frozen ground is not too much of a concern. We have the snow, high snow water content. Spring temperatures will play a primary role in the melt rate and timing. So stay tuned to see how uh, that comes to pass. Um, and then uh, as was mentioned, we have some future rainfall uh, uh, in the forecast and that timing uh, with the snow melt in the upper Mississippi could cause um, uh, you know, if the timing is just right, we could um, melt additional snow and add that to a, um, the existing already high flows, and that could just uh, exacerbate the, the overall flood conditions. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott uh, with the Missouri Basin. Thanks, Corey. Good afternoon, everybody. Flood risk for this spring is above normal for much of the Missouri River Basin. The map on the left here reflects the degree to which uh, today's conditions differ from normal. And the river level chosen for the comparison is minor flood stage. So this map shows by colors the comparison of the chance to reach flood stage this year against our normal historical chance for that site to reach flood stage. So here I've highlighted a few areas around the basin to help put this into some visual context. The eastern portion of the basin has a great, greatly enhanced risk for flooding as compared to the historical uh, this year. As we stated on our first call two weeks ago, 2019 was our third wettest year on record, going back 125 years of uh, data for the basin, and that has led to a high risk uh, for flooding, especially in the eastern portion of our basin. So going uh, to the next slide, looking at the mountain snowpack, this graphic courtesy of the Natural Resources Conservation Service shows the mountainous basin snowpack conditions in percent of average snow water equivalent. Mountain snowpack can be categorized as slightly above average in the mountainous west for this time of year. By this point in the winter, we have normally accumulated about 80% of the seasonal peak snow water equivalent in our mountains. So while the mountainous snow picture is coming into focus, things could still change over the next six or seven weeks. Moving on to the next slide, the February water supply forecast issued February 3rd by the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center is graphically summarized on the left. It suggests a near average mountain runoff year uh, volume, volumetrically speaking, for the mountainous west. Significant flooding from mountain snow melt alone is not expected this year. Moving forward to discuss the plain snowpack, appreciable plain snowpack is limited to the eastern Dakotas with widespread two to four inches of water equivalents. This is concerning and will play into the potential for major flooding in the James and Big Sioux River basins, which I'll touch on later. Moving forward to discuss flooded potential in Montana, in the Missouri watershed, highlighting those basins where our long range outlooks indicate a better of 50% chance of seeing flooding. Lodge Creek, Battle Creek, and Clear Creek are all expected to have minor flooding there. And uh, going to North Dakota, minor flooding is likely along the James River and Pipes Dim Creek. The flood potential in South Dakota, uh, we're expecting major flooding along the James and Big Sioux River rivers, and moderate level of flooding is likely along the Vermilion. Minor flooding is expected along the Cheyenne and White Rivers and today marks the 350th consecutive day of flooding for the James River. For, Nor uh, for Nebraska, moderate level flooding is likely along Wahoo Creek, and minor flooding is also likely along several of Nebraska streams, including the Platte River. For Iowa, the Big Sioux and Little Sioux Rivers are expected to reach major flood levels. The Oshiden is expected to see moderate level flooding. Minor flooding is expected also along few other rivers, including the Floyd River. Moving into Kansas, we are expecting, expecting moderate level flooding along the Little Osage and Smoky Hill Rivers along Stranger Creek. Minor flooding is also expected along all eastern Kansas. In Missouri, we are expecting moderate level flooding along several of our tributaries to the Missouri River, including the Grand and Platte. Minor flooding is also likely within the most of, of, of the other watersheds in the state of Missouri. In saving the Missouri main stem for last, we broke the, out the lower 800 miles on the Missouri River for its own slide. Flooding along the main stem of the Missouri River 
can be expected from Blair, Nebraska to the mouth at St. Louis. With this graphic, I'm going to point out a bit more than 90 days, uh, and that's to capture the entire uh, flood potential uh, for this um, continuous warm season going out through uh, September. With that said, moderate level of flooding should be planned for this reach extending from Nebraska City, Nebraska to the mouth. Major level of flooding cannot be ruled out below Kansas City. Many of the levees along the Missouri River downstream of Gavin's Point Dam have yet to be fully restored after the 2019 flood. Although the National Weather Service is continually communicating with other federal agencies with regard to current stage, river stage and flow relationships, our river stage outlooks and short-term forecasts will have a high degree of uncertainty due to the current uh, state of the river channel and overbank areas. So in summary, for the Missouri River Basin, snowpack in the mountains is slightly above average for this time of year. There exists an appreciable plain snowpack in the eastern Dakotas, which will play a significant role in the flood potential this spring. A relatively mild winter has prevented a deeply frozen ground condition to develop over most of the basin. And breakup ice jam flooding potential is less than it was, but folks still need to be watchful. This really depends on the rate of river ice thaw and the timing of our rain events. But I would like to say the risk for ice jam breakup flooding over most of the Missouri River Basin has been rapidly diminishing. Thunderstorm activity typically drives the spring flooding in the lower third of our basin. As so, uh, much above normal flood risk exists, exists across the eastern portion of the basin for 2020. Major flooding is likely in the northern tributaries and widespread minor to moderate flooding elsewhere. Thank you, and this concludes the flood potential brief for the Missouri Basin, and I will now turn the presentation over to James in the Arkansas Red River Basin. Thanks, Scott. Good afternoon again, everyone. Not much has changed in the two weeks since our last briefing in the Arkansas Red Basin, so I'll quickly go through our area. Starting with the snow water equivalent, the graphic on the left shows the latest from the Natural Resources Conservation Service for the Upper Arkansas River in Colorado. Snow water equivalent has fallen off somewhat, dropping from about 120% two weeks ago to 114% as of today. This still is a good sign for water supply, but doesn't cause much concern for us right now for spring flooding issues at this time. The image on the right shows the precipitation that has fallen during the last two weeks over our basin. The two wet areas were southeast Kansas and southwest Oklahoma into western Arkansas. Although not very impressive amount-wise, a good indicator of how saturated the soils are is that the one to two inches of rain in Kansas did produce some moderate flooding. Our next slide shows a change in the reservoir conditions over the past two weeks. These maps only show those reservoirs that were using at least 5% of their flood storage capacity. The one on the left is from two weeks ago, while the one on the right shows the data as of yesterday. And the one on the right also shows the change in percent over the past two weeks. Note that the rain in Kansas and also in southeast Oklahoma brought several reservoirs higher into their flood pool, while the lack of significant rain in east central Oklahoma allowed the Corps of Engineers to continue releasing the excess water and bring down lake levels. However, the floodwaters in Kansas and Oklahoma that occurred earlier this week have moved their, made their way down, and some of those reservoirs in northeast Oklahoma are actually a little bit higher than as depicted on the map right now. Um, the reservoirs still have most of their flood storage available, but uh, total storage is still slightly higher this year than last year at this time. Our next slide shows our long-term forecasts, which now extend through May, and continue to show scattered locations with a greater than 50% chance of flooding across the eastern half of the basin. We still aren't seeing any widespread areas of above 50% chance of flooding, but we continue to have a few rivers which we are concerned about where moderate flooding is expected. These include the Neosho in southeast Kansas and northeast Oklahoma, the Illinois and Poto rivers in eastern Oklahoma, Clear Boggy Creek in southeast Oklahoma, and the Fuslafe and Petagene rivers in west central Arkansas. And finally, on my summary slide, 
We have several rivers where we expect to see some spring flooding this year. And in general, we are continuing to call for an above normal flood potential across the eastern half of the Arkansas Red Basin. This, however, does not include the main stem of the Arkansas River in central Arkansas, nor the main stem of the Red River downstream of Lake Texoma, where we are expecting a near normal flood potential. The western half of the basin is also ex expected to be near normal. Finally, as a reminder, most of the spring flooding that does occur within the Arkansas Red Watershed is driven by convective storms, which can occur over any portion of the basin. And with that, I'll pass it on to Jeff at the Lower Mississippi River Forecast Center. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, we're gonna switch over to the Lower Mississippi River Flood Outlook. And we've had a pretty busy year already uh, from December through uh, right now. Uh, on our last uh, discussion, we had probably 80 to 90 points that were in flood. We've uh, lowered that from about 20 to 30 locations. So we're still got over 50 locations that are in flood uh, uh, from all the rainfall that we had. We had a band of five to 10 inches of rainfall that fell over the northern parts of Louisiana, extended through the northern parts of Mississippi into the, to the Tennessee Valley. And that uh, rainfall and stuff from about a week ago or so, we're still seeing residual rises and stuff on a number of the streams in the lower part of the Mississippi Valley. We currently also have minor to moderate flooding going on in the Mississippi River. And with that, we can switch to the next slide and talk about the Mississippi River. The lower Mississippi River and the Chafalaya Rivers, we, we continue to have minor to moderate flooding at this time from the, flood, from the rainfall that we had back in February. Right now, cresting conditions are just a little bit north of where the Arkansas River comes into the Mississippi uh, at Helena, Arkansas. But it's still gonna take another week before that uh, crest conditions work their way down to the New Orleans area. And then the uh, rainfall events that we uh, are anticipating for next week, uh, Monday through uh, almost Thursday timeframe, we probably will get another rise on the Mississippi River. Early indications are that we may exceed some of the levels that we saw from this current event where Cairo got up to 51.6. We may get another couple of feet higher. Just depends on where this rainfall falls and the magnitude and, and how much we actually get. But early indications are that we could at least uh, get to the same levels that we got, maybe even exceed those. So we'll have to watch very closely and people will need to keep a close eye on the forecast over the coming days. On the next slide, we'll switch over to Illinois, Kentucky, and Arkansas. Uh, we are due to see a potential for minor to moderate flooding on the black and white river systems in Arkansas. Uh, the rest of the area in southern parts of Missouri and stuff were only, indication, only indicated about minor flooding over on the St. Francis River. Uh, we also see minor flooding right now on the Washita, but I'll, uh, uh, we'll caution too that we do have a rain event coming next week and that may change some of these conditions here depending on where that rainfall sets up. On the next slide, we'll switch over to the Tennessee and Alabama. These areas have been exceptionally wet over the last couple of months. And so any of these locations that do get uh, heavier rainfall will definitely get minor to moderate flooding. And we can't rule out any isolated points getting some major flooding. We've already had some major flooding in some of the tributaries going into the Tennessee and northern Alabama. And with the rainfall and the projected wet conditions that we're looking at for the next month or two, we certainly could get more major flooding on some of these locations. And switching to the Louisiana, Mississippi area, um, just like we saw in the Tennessee Valley, a, a very heavy rain. We've had over 25 inches of rain over the last two months in the central parts of uh, Mississippi. So those areas are primed. If we are to get more significant rainfall, uh, we could get uh, some more major flooding over portions of the Big Black, Pearl Rivers, uh, and then uh, even in the uh, Yazoo Basin, the further northern portions of Mississippi, we're looking at kind of minor to moderate flooding, but we could rule out uh, maybe an isolated major flooding, uh, depending on how the rainfall uh, pattern sets up here over the coming weeks and months. Uh, we're also looking at just right now, just maybe minor to moderate flooding over in the Washita Basin in Northeast Texas. And those are really the, the, the areas that we have the, the higher threat for flooding. The, the rest of Louisiana and, and, and further westward, we're probably looking at more uh, normal uh, flood risk, but that doesn't mean that we can't get flooding, and typically we can get minor to even moderate flooding, even in a normal year. And so finally, on my summary slide here, we'll talk about the Mississippi. Uh, the Mississippi uh, tributaries going into the Tennessee, Yazoo and Pearl River really have the elevated areas for minor to moderate 
with even isolated major flooding is not, can't be ruled out for some of those locations. Uh, the flood risk is really above normal right now in the eastern portions, kind of east of the Mississippi River. But uh, again, with that rainfall event for next week, that could change some of the areas west of the Mississippi River. And just like uh, everyone has uh, indicated already, especially in their southern areas here, rainfall and thunderstorms will determine the final outcome of flood uh, risk for the lower Mississippi River. And with that, I will turn it back to Katie. All right, thanks, Jeff. So just to reiterate the key messages from today's presentation. The flood risk is above normal for the Mississippi River, the Red River of the North Basin, the Great Lakes Basin, and the eastern portions of the Arkansas Red River Basin. The greatest chances for moderate to major flooding are in portions of the Upper Mississippi River and the Red River of the North and the far eastern portions of the Missouri Basin. Normal flood risk is contained to the following areas, western portions of the Missouri Basin, western portions portions of the Arkansas Red Basin, and the Upper Ohio Basin. All right, and without further ado, we will move into our question and answer session. If you do have a question, please remember to type it into the question box on the GoToWebinar GUI, um, and it looks like we have our first question. Yeah, so we have one question here. Scott, this one's going to be for you. Uh, Brian Twombly asks, are there any insights into when the plain snow in the eastern Dakotas will melt, and will it start in the next week? Um, <clears throat> it's a great question, and uh, typically we uh, lose our plain snow melt, uh, plain snowpack um, starting in early March there. So uh, we actually have uh, warmer than uh, normal forecast going on for temperature, so it is very likely that we're going to start to see some snow melt in the, in the plains there with that. So as far as the amount or how much uh, runoff that will generate, it's yet to be seen. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, we will give you all another minute to type in your questions if you have them. Okay, um, we did have a question about precipitation in mid-June. Um, we are going to defer on that one. We will continue to run these webinars every two weeks, uh, and our spring flood outlook will come out uh, the third Thursday of March, so that will address the precipitation in mid-June, which is the question that we just got in right now. Um, it looks like there may be one more question. Okay, it looks like we do have one more question for Corey right now. Uh, so the question is, has the historic data associated with the flood gauges been updated recently to reflect mitigation activities and impacts? So repeat that question. Sure. Yeah, it says, has the historic data associated with the flood gauges been updated recently to reflect mitigation activities and impacts? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Um, you know, there's, I know there's been a lot of work, um, you know, like I said, mitigation and levy rehabilitation uh, with the uh, extensive flooding last year in 2019. Um, but we have not updated any, any of the information. Uh, in our models, um, I guess as a side note, in our modeling, we have um, 
attempted to update our period of record that's, uh, uh, you know, our, I guess our observed data that goes into our model. Uh, we're working to get the, um, up to uh, 20, water year 2018, I believe, because uh, we were at water year 2012. Uh, but I think we're still working on that and finishing up some of that information. We tried to get that before the flood season started, but we ran in some hiccups uh, in the winter time. So, um, but yeah, so um, we're, we're definitely trying to get the most up-to-date information that we can to put out the best forecast. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that, thanks, thanks, Corey, for that. Uh, we do have one more question. So I guess this is kind of to whichever service coordination hydrologist wants to take a stab at it. Uh, so the question is, are you able to characterize the major flood areas relative to their historic levels? So this is Jim here at the Ohio River Forecast Center. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and make an attempt in the, on that. And the answer is that's kind of what we're doing in our long range outlook is we are looking at what is normal risk and then how that risk is shifted. And so by doing that, in essence, you are characterizing how this year, um, and not only for major, but other flood levels, how that um, ranks relative uh, to normal. And so when you look at those graphs, you can look at how what's the normal risk at say moderate, major, minor, whatever level you choose, um, whatever the <clears throat> impact uh, number is for you, and then how is that risk uh, relative to that normal risk? Yeah, this is uh, Scott Doomer at the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center. Uh, the very first slide in my presentation, I was, that's what I was talking about there. And it was the chance of reaching flood stage this year as compared to uh, what we normally can uh, see. And we had certain uh, circles shaded there in our area. So we have anywhere between uh, 10 to 30% chance greater of flooding, chance for uh, to hit minor flood stage in Missouri and in the central Nebraska, western South Dakota, and then a 30 to 50% uh, greater than normal chance of reaching minor flood stage in western Iowa and eastern Nebraska, with a 50 to 70% chance um, greater than climatolo climatology of reaching flooding in eastern South Dakota and south central uh, North Dakota. And again, some of that's already in, we're already flooding in some of those locations already. So that kind of skews the numbers. And then in uh, northern, north central Montana, we have a 30 to 50% greater uh, chance of hitting minor flood stage than we normally do. Okay, thank you, Jim and Scott, for that. It looks like we do not have any more questions. So, um, as a reminder, this webinar will be is being recorded and will be sent out tomorrow. Um, so, for whoever couldn't make it, or if you want to forward it on to someone, um, also we will host a third webinar on March 12th, Thursday, March 12th, at 2:30 p.m. Central Time. Um, invites to that webinar and information will be emailed out to you soon. Please remember, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your local weather forecast office for further assistance. And with that, we will wrap up. Thanks, everyone, for your participation, and have a great afternoon.